All right, we are live. Hi, everyone. My name is Mark. I'm a co-chair at Udacity for the Intro to Programming Now degree. Joining me online is Luke. He is also another co-chair. And today, we're just going to do a little broadcast and talk about functions. What are functions? How do we use functions? Um, what are tip, the tips and tricks to use functions? And what are the common gotchas and, and the common things that you need to look out for in functions? Because, yeah, majority of everyone will be uh, learning Python right now. And you will be learning functions or have learned functions. And we feel like this is a very important concept, such as much like loops and decision statements, like if and else statements, you know these functions make up a core, I think a very very core core um, concept in programming. What do you think, Luke? Like how how important are functions in just in programming? Um, without so functions are, I mean they're they're one of the most basic things. They're one of the most foundational things you do in programming. Everything you do, if, if you're a competent programmer, will involve writing lots and lots of functions. They're sort of the one of the smaller bits of um, bits of the programming world that you will use constantly. It's it's very, very foundational. It's something that you have to you really should make sure that you understand very well about what it is, how to use it, um, everything like that. Yeah. Um, so yeah. yeah, great. Thanks for your in, uh, viewpoint, Luke. And I, I agree with you. If the functions did not exist if um, we would not be able to program as efficiently and as elegantly as we can in this world. So, again, if you walk, one thing that you should walk away from this uh, broadcast is functions are very important, and you should invest the time into practicing creating as many functions as you can. Because uh, trust me, trust us, this will be, this will help you with your in for the rest of your programming career. Great. So we're going to start uh, doing our uh, talk. Start talking about our uh, our presentation. So, but if you have any questions relating to functions, please post these uh, online, and we'll address these uh, questions for you as well. So, Luke, you have the floor. Okay. Um, so the the first thing that that we really should establish when we're talking about functions is exactly what a function is. Uh, so. Functions, which we'll also probably refer to as procedures since they're the same thing in Python, um, they're bits of code that you can call repetitively. Now, generally, when you think about functions, you're, you're thinking about something with defined input and defined output. But um, foundationally, in, in Python, functions are something that you can define once and then use as many times as, you, as you'd like. Um, so if I were to screen share a little bit here. Um, so the, the first thing to, to, as far as using functions that you should know is how to make them. So you, you start uh, a function with the keyword def. That's your def definition of the function. Um, then you give it some name. Um, the, the name would be some function here. And then these two parentheses um, are necessary for a function. It, is where you would define some parameter if you had one. Um, we'll go over what those are later. But you, you need here, There's we're going to use just a function with no parameters whatsoever. Um, then you need a colon. And then whatever is inside that indentation is going to be your function. That's going to be the code that you can reuse however often as you want. Um, it, it looks, so I will just, just say yeah. that. Hey, look, it's hard to, to interrupt you, but I just want to really uh, emphasize how important indentations are in Python. You will find some other programs, they don't care about indentation. But in order to be able to define your functions appropriately, you need to indent all of the lines that belong in your function, or else your function will not work. Um, and as we're going on with indentation, it's unindenting back to where the function was the same level the function was defined at that ends the function. Um, you can also end the function with a return statement, which we'll go over later. Um, but that's that's not really ending where the definition would end. That's just ending where the code will stop running. But the in Python, the the function end is where it unindents. But 
Um, so as, as we were kind of going over with, with a function, you, you give it some code to run in here. So let's just say we're going to print um, hello world. So that's what the function does. Now to call the function, you simply call it by saying the name, no def, no colon here. And with the with the given parameters you're going to use. So if I were to run this, um, which which I obviously just had right before we started, I'm going to get the output "Hello World." In fact, if I can do this however many times I want with calling the function, and it will run three times here, three times. Um, hopefully, all of that's visible for you. But yeah, so. Now, as we as we keep going here, some uh, there's a few things to note about functions that are very important. Functions create something called a local scope. So, a variable that you make inside of a function doesn't exist outside of the function. Um, this is in con contrast with a global scope, where the some variable that you make will be available at all times. So, as a as a quick example of that. Um, Let's just make um, make some function that does something pretty simple. So here we're having a global variable called a equals six, and we're having a local variable called a equals five. So both variables are named a, but they're not the same variable. So we can see that by when we're running our function, printing out a string um, that prints out a. And remember, we redefined a here is, is equal to 5. And then after our function is done running, um, we can print what the global variable is. Sorry. Um, and, and as we run that whole thing, you'll see that inside the function, a equals 5, and then outside, a equals 6, because it never got redefined. This a, this a has nothing to do with this A. Although they have the same name, they don't point to the same object. Um, one, one thing to note here is that this A right here, after we run some function, it's destroyed. It ceases to exist. So uh, that's uh, with how global works. If we were to take out this A equals 5, you'll notice that we the functions should still work. All of a sudden, we're just using the global version of A since we never make a local version of A. However, if we take out this um, this string A right here is going to produce an error. So um, if I make this a little larger, it runs this successfully. And then when it gets to here, this A isn't doesn't exist anymore. It's gone. So this produces an error saying that a is not defined. Um, the the reason again why that that happens is this a is global. It can work anywhere. This a is local. It only works inside the function. Um, so for a way around that, we have something called parameters as far as how we're going to get in some variable that, that we actually want to use inside the function without relying on global variables. So as, as a quick aside here, global variables are generally a big no-no in programming. Uh, sometimes you're going to end up doing using them just because they're easiest for the short thing you're doing. But you should, if there's a way to avoid global variables, avoid global variables. Always stick to, stick to local variables, because then you can't screw something up that you don't think you're going to screw up with your function. But um, so on to parameters. So I'll just copy and paste this quick. Um, a parameter is some value that can be passed into a function. So here, um, I, I made uh, some uh, same, same name as the function that I get. I pass in parameter 1 and parameter 2. So when you actually do that to call it, those values can be anything you want. So it doesn't have to, like, they don't have to be called parameter 1 or parameter 2. You don't have to pass in a variable that has that same name. All you have to do is put them in order, and they both have to exist. So if I were to run this, 
um, I'm going to get, first I'm going to run print parameter one, which you can see is hello world here. And the second thing I'm going to get is two, since that's what I passed in for parameter two. Now, if I only gave this hello world, what's going to happen is that I'm going to get an error because the function takes two parameters, the, the arguments, another name for parameters here, and then I only gave it one. So that's always something you have to, have to um, watch out for here. Um, this can also be done with variables. So let's say instead of put, passing in hello world, I want to pass in a variable that says hello world, um, and then b equals 2. So I'll get the same thing here by passing in two variables, the same way I would have with just the print function, or the print, print um, statement, where that will, once again, pass in a, the value of a, to parameter 1, and the value of b to parameter 2. Um, one, one quick thing to note here is what happens to parameter 1 doesn't affect a. Um, because these are things that are called immutable objects. So if you've, depending on how far you've gotten into the course, uh, you'll have found things like lists and dictionaries to be mutable objects, as opposed to immutable objects, which are things like strings, ints, floats, um, your, your standard uh, your, your standard variables that you'll you probably use the most that aren't containers. So a good quick uh, starting point for mutability is uh, a good understanding of variables themselves. So um, here, if I, if I can just open up uh, interpreter here and do this more easily that way. Um, I'll run it straight from straight from the command line here or the terminal. So just running Python. Um, so with variables, a variable points to a value that it holds in Python. So say I have a equals 5. A is, oh, that was supposed to. So it's already running Python. A equals 5. A now is a variable that points to the value 5. Um, sorry. The when you change an immutable value in, for uh, an immutable variable, what you're doing is you're changing what the thing points to. So you're not actually changing the the constant five. You're changing a to to point to some new value. So I can see this with the id function. This gives me what it's pointing to. If I were to ch change that to six, but I get if I say id a is a completely, notice that this is different than this, um, that it's pointing to an entirely different object. So 5 here being an object and 6 being an object where they're explicitly not the same thing that's being pointed to. They're different values. Now, if I try that same thing with a mutable object, so let's just say a list of some sort, so now I'm going to say A is some list, and I take ID of A. I can alter that list. Um, so just to show it's altered, it's now that. And I get the exact same value for ID of A. It points to the same object. The list is still the same list. It's just mutated. It's changed. Hey, Luke, uh, yep. can you? Increase the font size a bit. Gotcha. So quick overview of what I did now with legible font sizes. Um, the when I when I switched a from equaling five to six ints, which are immutable values, the ID actually changed. Um, because six and five were constants. They didn't change, so the pointer that A referred to had to. Now when I made it a list. Um, the ID did not change when I changed the list because the list itself changed instead of the pointer. So that's that's how variables work um, as far in, in Python. And that's going to have um, pretty dramatic effects with what we're doing with, uh, with functions here. So 
moving back to Sublime. If I pass in an immutable variable or a mutable variable to a function, um, what happens to the variable inside the function happens to it outside. When I pass in an immutable variable, the you can you can change with you can see with the very word immutable, that variable the, what happens inside the function does not affect what what value is passed in. So let's just write up a, a quick little part um, to to show this. Um, let's have some function and give it some list as a parameter. Inside the function, we can just append one to the list. Um, and then let's print out what the local variable of that is. Now, if we define some list over here and then pass it into the function, um, A is our parameter here. It's given, um, it's given to some list. Then what happens when we print out A after that, notice that what happened inside also happened outside. That same exact thing does not happen if I were to, say, give this the value 5. Um, and even though we're calling it some list, I just add one to it. As previously demonstrated, the local changes to six, the global does not. It's not altered. The immutable object is not mutated inside the list. Um, this instead, the sum list, the parameter, becomes a local variable. Even though a was a global variable, the parameter sum list, which was given the value of a, is now a local variable. It's destroyed at the end of the function. A itself is not altered because of that. Um, so what do we want to do if we want to actually get out some value from a function um, for some immutable value? Well, that's where return statements come from, or come in. So um, let's just change this so it doesn't say list, because that looks bad for you know readability purposes. So some value, some value here. Um, let's say I wanted to actually change the value there and get, get something out of it. Let's return some list. The return does exactly what it looks like. It gives the variable back. So how I would do that is I would assign some variable here to x, um, and then x takes whatever this variable was here, and it, it just takes the value. So quickly it, doing that. It, I, think, yep. I think you need to change some list to some value. Oh, yep. Yep. And one As more. You like, see, right? Yeah, on line two. Uh, yep. There we go. Uh, so I didn't actually do anything with x here. Well, I did. yes, I did. I printed it out. So this is the value taken from um, the return value. So one, one cool thing here is you can actually return multiple values here. Um, so that's technically returning a tuple. As you can see, if I do this again, it, it gives it a tuple value to x. But at the same time, I could do something like this. And it will actually understand what I want to do there. Um, x will just take the first value. y and z are now equal to 1 and 2, because that's what I returned. Um, so a return value also stops the function wherever it's at. So if I added um, that at the end of it, this will never be read, because it's after a return statement. Notice nothing changed when I built that. It, the, 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 the high right there simply doesn't get read. It exists as part of the function definition, but because it's a, it comes after a return um, in the sequence that the program's run, so the program will run this line, then this line, and then this line, 
this line will end the program and it will never see the print high. Um, so um, you can do multiple things with the return value. For instance, you can print it out directly. So um, let's just take out these print statements. So I could print what's returned from some function here. And I'll get the tuple that, that's returned. I'll get some value 1, 2. Um, so I don't even have to save it in a, value, uh, a variable. I can also just run it. And here, nothing would happen since nothing's printed out. Um, and the sign, basically not assign what's returned to anything if that's if I'm looking for um, something that the function did in here to say some mutable value that I wanted changed but didn't actually care what was returned. Um, I don't have to deal with what's returned, but it's generally useful to deal with what's returned. Um, that's actually a, a very important thing that some, sometimes some, um, as a beginner, a lot of people might get a little confused with, um, the difference between print and return. So print simply, this console right here, um, print simply puts whatever value you're printing onto that console. It, it literally prints to what you as a human can read. It doesn't alter the state of the program. It doesn't alter the flow of how the program's running. All it does is show you something that you want from the program. Return, on the other hand, does absolutely nothing to the console. It ends a function and brings that, that value from that function to some external variable if you assign it to an external variable. Um, which actually brings me to another thing. Let's say I don't return anything. I return nothing. What do you think will happen here? Oh, first I have to print x. Notice that even without returning anything, what happens is that um, I end up returning none. I can even do that without the return statement. So it still returns none. Because in Python, none is it's what would be considered, it's a, it's a null value. It, null um, in other programming languages is often what, what's used what, in what Python is none. It's essentially a value that has no value. Um, it has, the value it has is none. Um, it's literally uh, its own value type, so it's not a string. It's just the value non, the same as true and false would be Booleans. But all functions or procedures in Python return something, um, by which I mean if you don't assign a return value, they return none. So if you ever get none where you weren't expecting it when you're trying to print something, that's probably a, so a sign that you're you're possibly printing where you meant to return or something like that where you're printing the value from a function that doesn't return anything. Um, sometimes you explicitly want to return none. That, that tends to be the case when you um, are testing explicitly to see if you get to a state in the program. Um, it's, a, it's a nice default holder since it doesn't really take up any space as far as if you're going to change some value into, say, a list. It's a nice default value, which we won't really get into here. But um, it has its uses, but that's that's sort of the main point of um, that. That's one of the reasons, actually, that, that Python doesn't have a difference between procedures and functions. So in math, a function is something which maps some unique input to some output. Um, for example, f of x equals mx plus b, the equation of a line. Um, in programming languages, the function tends to be something pretty similar. It takes input in the form of parameters slash arguments, um, and it gives output from what it returns. But it, in some programming languages, it, uh, functions don't actually affect anything other like outside of that. If there are no mutatable values, then um, the what happens in the function stays in the function. It only has parameters and or input and output. Um, on, on the other side of that, in some other programming languages, procedures might just be sort of subroutines, things that um, you run that don't return any values, but which just do something to other values in the program. Um, by the way, a, a quick aside, when a function does do things other than take input and give output, it actually alters some mutable values. We call that alteration 
um, a side effect of the program. So sometimes a side effect to the function, I should say. Um, sometimes you literally a side effect of the function is the whole point. So it's sort of a misnomer on that effect. But um, the that it's it's a piece of terminology you might find useful at some point. Um, another reason why Python procedures and functions aren't actually different is that you notice that since every function returns something, um, there isn't like a true procedure that doesn't return anything because you, you implicitly return none. Um, did you have anything to add, Mark? Mm, other than the fact that, like, we've noticed a lot of people get confused between print statements and return uh, statements as, and yeah, we would just really like to like reemphasize that print is really different from return. They are two different things. They, the, the only common thing is they, they get you some sort of value and then you, you have to, you, you manipulate this value because a lot of people will, will create a function and then they'll print the function, they run it and they, they print it and they're like, okay, that's the value that I got from my function. But in essence, you're just, you're printing, you're running a print statement and then you're re returning none. So it's a very subtle difference, but I think it's, it's worth uh, re-emphasizing. And okay. one, yeah, one thing, uh, Luke, before, yeah, it looks like we don't have any questions. It looks like you know, our viewers are, you know, they're, 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 they're getting it. We, we hope you're, uh, everyone's getting it. Can you show us an example of multiple return statements? What would that look like? Okay. Um, so let's screen share again. Yeah. Um, so um, I, I'm assuming you're referring to in if statements? Yeah, if statements like that's a okay. very common way to, to do it. Okay. So let's say Can you uh, uh, increase the size of the text further? Okay. Yeah. Okay. And so there, there's also like the window is like small, Luke. Like the window itself. Can you increase that window? Ah, oh, there you go. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, better. Um that's weird to me because the, the window is actually bigger just now than it was for most of the presentation, but oh, okay. <laughs> who knows, weird quirks. Um, so a lot of times you can have return different things depending on what you're doing. So um, let's actually return the type, um, like let's return different things based on the type of some value. So with Python, we don't actually have to specify what type our parameters in are for a function, um, which is a lot different than a lot of other languages, say, in C or C++ or Java, you're going to have to um, specify that, say, if you want an, an integer here, you're going to actually have to specify that you want an int in that spot um, so that the program doesn't crash. But here, um, we can return different things depending on whether or not we have an int. And then we can just maybe return a value of that int um, versus if we have um, something that's not an int, we can just return a, a straight string like that. Um, and then we can run this function on uh, a variety of different things. So let's say 25. That should get one. Actually, let's print all these out so that we can see what we have. Um, and then let's print, actually, this should be fun, 25.0, since that should be a float. Um, if we run this, we'll notice that the first one is an int, and so it returns one. The second one is not an int, and so it returns the string, not an int. Um, we have different return statements here because, well, we have an if statement that goes from one place to another, depending on what the, the sum value is. Um, Actually, one, one big trip up that I'll, is found quite a few times here would be something like a while statement or a for loop. So um, let's say I want to just print that if statement or some value 10 times. Um, so let's make a counter. Well, let's just do the, the for loop. For, um, 
E in range 10. Um, if you do this, you're going to end up only doing it once because the function will end as soon as you get here. So it's only going to run once. Whereas um, if you had wanted to print it out more times or wanted to make some list actually have it, you have to move the return to outside of the for loop. Um, inside the for loop, anytime you hit that return, it's going to end the function even in the middle of a loop. So that's, that's one big thing to remember about return statements. Um, the return statement ends the function immediately, regardless of whether it's in something that shouldn't necessarily, you wouldn't think of ending um, without any on its own, like a for loop. A return, a return statement always ends the function. Um, there's actually some fun things you can do with return statements that you wouldn't, um, you won't really encounter so much in this class, although CS101 has quite a bit of it, which is recursion. Um, so you technically don't need loops, although Python's not particularly well set up for recursion, because you could use a function to call itself. So instead of returning some value, we could actually turn, return some function here, um, which you'll notice is going to be an infinite loop because it's just going to keep calling itself over and over and over again. But if we say made an if statement that, um, I just typed an if statement. If we make an if statement that um, has some base value that, so you can think of a recursion sort of like, in the same way as a loop, it has to have a stopping condition. We would call this a base case, and that, that stopping condition is what sort of ends the loop, and then the recursion will sort of end and keep, each value will be finally returned to the function that called it, and then at last your, your function will end. Um, one of the reasons Python is actually not particularly well suited for it is that it, well, it's actually kind of well beyond the scope of this class, but it uh, each function has a certain amount of overhead, and you run just straight up run out of memory for um, how many functions are simultaneously called instead of one function ending and then calling the next one. Um, so a while loop doesn't really take up much memory. It just keeps on going over and over, whereas recursion takes up a lot of memory in something like, something like Python. Um, should, should I demonstrate an actual recursive case? Oh, uh, yeah, just something very simple. Okay. Would, would suffice. Okay, so let's say um, let's make a counter here. Um, take this out. So if count equals 0, we're going to have that be our base case. Just ret um, return some value. Else, return um, some function. some value plus one, count plus one. So this is kind of a pointless function, but we can call it anyway. Um, oh, it shouldn't be oh. count minus zero. Minus one, right, yeah. Yes, well, unless I start with a negative number, that would, you'll, it, recursion has the same fun with loops is, only, only it takes a little bit getting used to in your head about if I started out with a count um, bigger than zero, if I had plus one here, it would never end. It would just get a, um, basically, I'd get an infinite loop. But an, an infinite loop that ends more quickly than normal, because Python will tell me that, hey, I'm completely out of memory. Um, but then I can do that and get, um, see what I get out for my final value here. Oh, it looks like I needed that. There you go. Yay. So it returns every value between 
um, 25 and 35 because I print some value every time and then 10 is how many times I'm going to call itself um, and then it simply adds one to count every or subtracts one to count until we get to zero when we get to zero it actually prints some value um, to show you how the, the difference between this and a normal infinite loop if I were to actually give this let's just give it a negative number so it it um, destroys itself nice and quick Notice that it actually hits a max recursion depth, um, and actually hits a maximum recursion depth pretty quickly. You could be sitting at an infinite loop, wondering if your program is just slow for minutes. Um, if you have a particularly involved uh, program that has to go through a fantastically large amount of data, but with recursion, if you go too deeply, um, the program will basically cut itself off right there in only half a second. Um, the main problem with that is that if you actually have a lot of stuff that you have to go through, the program will cut itself off in half a second, and you'll never get through all of it. Um, it will just make an error, even though theoretically there shouldn't have to be one if you had a computer with infinite memory. Um, but that's just a, a quick aside there. It's a, it's a pretty recursion, something that you use in algorithms quite a bit um, for at least like saying graph theory, um, it's pretty useful. It's it's easier to think of in certain cases. Obviously, loops um, loops are actually tend to be faster in almost all languages. Um, so sometimes where you use recursion, and anything that's possible with recursion is also possible with loops. Um, but sometimes it's easier to set up recursion than it is to set up a loop, and so it's useful to do something with recursion because it's simply much easier to. But um, that was, shall we do another recursive thing that maybe has a point, or should I? I think, I think we're good, Luke. Yeah, okay. yeah we don't want to overload our, our students. <laughs> so right. like, yeah, but I think that was a good, um, let me switch to, to to my broadcast over here in the office. I think like it's a uh, recursion. It's just another way to use functions. And once you get the hang up like of knowing how to return things, knowing how to process parameters, arguments, and knowing how to um, process them, and then you know basically take take these functions and use them in your day to day programming, recursion will will start to get. Uh, make a little more, little bit more sense, especially if you're if it involves programs or problems that involve algorithms or any other type of mathematical or calculation where you're you're not sure about the the length of like your total calculations. Like let's assume that I want to be able to calculate ten things, right? I could just simply use a loop. But if I want to be able to calculate it may be 10 things, it may maybe 15 things, it may be 120 things. I don't know until I actually execute it. That's when recursion is actually really, really useful. So, but yeah, thanks, Luke, for showing us, give us a little sneak peek. So, um, again, in summary, about functions, functions are, again, very important. These are the building blocks of programming. They're very, very basic ways to increase your efficiency as a coder and also in, to increase your power. But again, these base, these are the base things that you need to know in programming in order for you to be able to do like any other fancy stuff that you you may have seen that other people have, have done in programming. Um, uh, you know, functions are made of you know inputs and outputs. So basically, a function is a way to map an input to an output. You take it, you take some sort of input. We call that a parameter or an argument. We do something to it, and we transform it in some way, and then we give it an output. We actually actually return it, or and or change the the argument if it's a mutable uh, var variable such as a list. We actually process it, and that's why we procedures and functions are. Uh, use interchangeably because again, it's you're you're changing something, and you're either returning the variable or you change the variable, and then you're just returning none. Uh, what else? Any other things to that our students should walk away? Look. Um. 
So functions, again, just they're very, very foundational. Make sure you have a good grasp on functions. Uh, it's, always, it's always good to try some stuff out yourself. So um, maybe try out some stuff with local and global scope, thinking about what, what those mutable variable, variables will, how they'll actually change depending on what you do inside your function. Um, for instance, the difference between defining a new um, mutable variable inside your function, which would be local scope, versus changing that mutable variable that you had um, from your global scope, which will be from the global scope. Um, it's, it's good to play around with this with stuff. So um, that's, I suppose, my only real recommendation there. Awesome. Well, thanks, Luke, for that awesome presentation. Yeah, so hopefully you walk away watching this broadcast and you could, you're could you fired up. You could just try it yourself, just create functions, and just practice with it. it Again, practice makes the like that's the it's very true in programming. So it's just the world's your playground. You just fire up your Python interpreter and just play around with what exactly what Luke did, and hopefully you you'll just you'll you'll start to get a good intuitive sense of what what these uh, functions are in Python. Great. So uh, yeah, we hope everyone. Um, got something away from the, these functions. I think next week, let's see, let me look at what what will we be talking about next week. Loading here, so what's next week? Do, do, do. Nineteenth would be next week. I think that looks like it's uh, it's it's style. The importance of following coding uh, style. Okay, thanks. Yeah, it's like I don't know. Internet was slow here. So yeah, basically coding style for HTML, CSS, and Python style. So this is another very important thing concept to learn is how do you program in a good style that makes your code readable and shareable and also makes it more organized. Because I really think if how you style and how you organize your code uh, tells a lot about how you, you know, how efficient your, uh, your program can, can run. Like that's, I, I always, I'm a big, um, big proponent of making sure that your style, your your variables are defined right. You're you're organizing your code clean and clearly. It shows that you're you have a good uh, sense of what you're doing and where you're going. Awesome. Well, hopefully we'll see you next week. All right, and thank you everyone. Bye.